What's up, potheads and political junkies? Jeremiah here, editor of Cannabis Culture Magazine. This is CCN Live. It's August 31st, and that was a very nice bong rip, Duchess. Thank you. And thanks, Mr. Marius, for turning the lights on. Appreciate it. What's up, guys, in the chat? What's up, Yoda? I guess I should talk into the microphone. It is August 31st, and it is a beautiful day here in Vansterdam. The sun's shining, and uh, we're getting high here. Marijuana man's in the house. Oh, if you can hear him back there. So we got a big show for you guys today. A lot going on in the episode. We'll probably go a little long like we uh, have been lately. We have Dana Larson on the show. Super activist Dana Larson, now of Sensible BC, which is his latest project, a group trying to put British Columbia, a, a bud initiative on the British Columbia ballot. This is going to be very cool. Uh, when we have our next election in BC, we could be voting to legalize marijuana here in the province. Uh, it's not easy to get a ballot initiative on the ballot here in this province, and not quite as easy as, as it is in the United States. And of course, right now, there's, there's three legalization initiatives on uh, the ballots in Oregon, Colorado, and Washington State, as well as a gamut of other medical marijuana ones across the country. But yeah, this one uh, should be interesting to see if we can do the same thing in British Columbia. They were successful here in the province recently with an anti-HST initiative that uh, was able to be put on the ballot with a lot of work that went into it. So we're hoping for a similar type of success. So uh, is the mic working and everything, Marius? We're all good? Seems good. Awesome. So Dana's coming on the show. Also, we have uh, Jeff from Skunk Funk. You may know him uh, in Saskatoon from Skunk Funk, the head shop there. He's at the heart of the activism community there in the prairies, on the prairies. And this weekend is the Prairie Medicinal Harvest Cup. Two days of pot smoking, uh, medical marijuana strains from the prairies and across Canada. There's actually a story on the front page of Cannabis Culture right now about it by yours truly. You can find out the details there and you can get tickets at a bunch of different stores on the prairies if you happen to be in the neighborhood. Jeff's gonna come on and talk about what's happening there. Uh, also on the show, Kayla Blanford is coming on. She is the first person in Canada to be arrested at a medical, or sorry, at a vapor lounge. She's the first person to be arrested for possession inside a Canadian vapor lounge. So she was actually at the Hotbox Cafe where she did work. She had just quit actually and was planning to move to Vancouver. And the cops came in there and arrested her and charged her with possession. First time it's happened that we know of. So uh, we'll play a video clip I filmed with her a couple days ago. And we'll actually play the video of her being arrested as well which is interesting. And then finally on the show, uh, what's the last thing I have on the show, Marius? Who's, who else is on the show today? So, me? Is it me? Marius is on the show. Marius is going to come on and tell us about uh, what's going on with him. Uh, he's actually ha doing something interesting, so I don't want to spoil it <laughs> by uh, giving it all away. But, oh, and of course, I can't forget, we do have another guest on the show, not just Marius, you're not the last guest, Mark Clokeed. So right here in Vancouver, Mark Clokeed, you might know him from Kush.ca. He's the weed guy on Pod TV. He's also the founder of the I Medicate Medical Marijuana Dispensary here in Vancouver. They had two locations until one was raided last February. Mark and his mom were both arrested uh, and charged now. So the charges have been laid. Mark is going to join us. As a fugitive, he's going to join us from China. There's a warrant out for his arrest right now in the province of BC, but he's on vacation in China. He's actually in China partly to record footage for a new film he's working on with activist and historian Chris Bennett about the history of cannabis and its use by shamans and people throughout history. He's there to film uh, an ancient mummy, a, a shaman, with a big bowl of cannabis. I believe it's the oldest corpse they've ever found with cannabis cannabis corpse so uh, it's gonna be he's got a multi-purpose visit here today so we'll talk to him about the movie the film we'll talk to him about his latest charges what's going on with I Medicaid what's going on with Kush.ca what happened with the Kush cup we could even do a little wrap-up on that so that's the big show um, but before even all that happens I want to address an issue that we talked a little bit about on marijuana man show earlier in the week and that's IQ testing and marijuana and how marijuana smoking affects adolescents who have smoked pot. A study just recently came out uh, in New Zealand that showed a relationship between pot smoking between the ages of 13 and 18 and the effect or the low test scores, low IQ test scores, a drop in eight points actually. There's a correlation between the two. 
Um, now I'm going to play a video clip from Global TV. I think the study's bogus myself. I think that it only shows a correlation. This is something that they're not talking about. It only shows a correlation. It does not show a causal relationship. So it doesn't mean that those people who smoked it, that's the reason their IQ dropped. It just means that it happens to be that those people who did, their IQ dropped. So that could be for another of under other reasons that aren't mentioned in the study. Um, for instance, when you're 13 years old and you're smoking marijuana, you're probably more likely to not be taking part in high school or dropping out of your classes, that kind of stuff. So that itself could be a reason. So, you know, it's not necessarily a causal relationship. Even if it's true, um, it's another reason to legalize so we can regulate and control it and get it out of the hands of kids. Right now, marijuana is easier to get for a kid than booze is. And that's because booze is regulated. Alcohol, you have to have, you have a gatekeeper there. You got to get a boot for you. Got to have a bootlegger. But uh, with cannabis, you can get it from your high school right now. It's the wild, wild west. It's all over the place. So, um, yeah, and somebody said, I don't think high school uh, boosts your IQ necessarily. I don't, I don't either. That's just one example. But it just goes to show you it could be lifestyle. It could be any number of different things that this study does not account for. Uh, so I don't think it's very good science. But anyway, we should play the video. This is from Global TV, and watch for a sensible spot by CC publisher Jody Emery in this one. Holy moly. Choking up may seem like a good time, but according to a new study for teenagers, it could come with a price. Research out of New Zealand has found teens who smoke marijuana regularly may suffer long-term damage to their brains and risk a drop in their IQ. BC's provincial health officer says the study confirms what the medical community already knew. It's quite clear, I think, from the study that what they call persistent and dependent use of cannabis, which would be very heavy use of daily use of cannabis, is clearly associated with intellectual deficits of about like eight IQ points in their study. The study followed over 1,000 children from New Zealand for 25 years. Subjects then took IQ tests at age 13 before they smoked cannabis and again years later at the age of 38. The data showed when it came to testing memory, participants who smoked marijuana at least four times a week scored significantly worse than those who didn't. But perhaps more alarming, the study also found quitting pot later in life didn't reverse the damage. The fact that it's related to age, early age of initiation is consistent with some of the concerns that researchers have about here in BC, how early people are starting to use marijuana and how heavy the marijuana is here in terms of the content now because it's gotten to be much stronger and also the fact that a lot of our, we have very high rates of heavy marijuana use here in BC. Jody Emery is the wife of Mark Emery, who's currently serving time in a U.S. federal prison for selling cannabis seeds. She says these latest findings are just more proof marijuana should be legalized and the current laws around cannabis are doing more harm than good. And once you make it legal and you're able to talk about it openly, then you can educate properly, you can work towards harm reduction, and if young people are experiencing problematic use, they'll be able to get help for that instead of feeling uh, stigmatized. Whether or not marijuana should be legalized is up for debate. What may not be are the harmful effects of the drug and its lasting consequences for young people who smoke regularly. So that, that little news clip is really bad. They have a bunch of people from universities theorizing on, oh, well, marijuana is a lot stronger these days than it ever was before. That itself is, I think, a, a not really a fact. Uh, I don't know if it's stronger or not. That's thrown around a lot, but I think Marijuana Man might have something to say about that. How strong, yeah, Marijuana Man says next show might be about how strong is your weed, or how strong was your weed. No, yes. global, global TV, the way they ended the clip, Marius, I don't know if you guys can hear because of the microphone, but Marius just noted that at the end of the clip, she says, basically, what's not under debate is yeah. whether or not it causes this. That's not true at all. This study is not the be-all and end-all, and it does not prove anything. It doesn't prove any causal relationship. So. But, of course, the press constantly lets us down. Um, I'm glad to see Jody was there, though, to, to answer with uh, at least a little bit of sensibility that even if this study is true, it just is one more reason why we need to legalize pod. So I think what we should do is I want to just quickly play a little video, a music video, and then we're going to bring 
Oh, it's almost 420, though. So maybe we should. You want a bong rip, Marius? I'm going to do one. Sure. And, uh, well, the, the video is three minutes long. So the video is three minutes. Yeah, well. Then, okay, I see 420. Yeah, we don't want to, we don't want to yeah. cancel 420 here. Sure. I'll get you to come on. Why don't you come and talk about what you're doing, Marius? Oh, well, that's a, it's not a, sure, it's not a big thing. I, mean, I think it's kind of cool, though. So I think it's something definitely worth noting here on the show. And it's pot related. I'll try to keep it civil. <laughs> no, you don't want to keep it civil. Fuck it up, man. This mic. Hey, everybody. Hey. It's Marius here. Um, some of the people who follow me on Facebook uh, may have noticed that uh, I've changed my uh, name on there from Soska to Stoner. Um, the reason being is that uh, I, uh, I do not have communication with my family and haven't... Uh, haven't for a long time. I haven't really been welcome in the home since I was, I don't know, 22 or something, and that was a long time. And because I had no, absolutely no support from them, from them since I was a teenager, um, and basically not welcome there, I don't really feel like that I'm a Soska. So I've been thinking for many, many years that uh, I want to change my name to something more suited. And since I'm into science fiction, I've been thinking along those lines. But recently. Uh, uh, because of cannabis, uh, that was also an option for me. That was one of the uh, avenues that I pursued. And uh, I've come across the name Stoner. That seems to uh, fit me perfectly. <laughs> because, uh, so now, in the future, uh, my stage name will be Marius Stoner. And I'm looking into changing my name legally to Marius Stoner. Um, what would be, would there be something that would stop you from doing it legally? Well, just if it just any complications that might arise. I don't think there will be, so I'll probably just do it. But just in case my life will be too complicated it, with banking or traveling or anything, anything Stoner. like that, probably not. Yeah. I doubt that. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm going to say, say that. There probably are few stoners out there. Mm. You know, because uh, exactly. in exactly. history, maybe I, I, I a think stoner I may have remembered. made things out of stone. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah. The guy who uh, threw uh, stones at the hooker may have been a stoner. Stoner. No. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> About Sorry that. about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but anyways, right. um, so I'm gonna, I am now, uh, you might as well call me Marius Stoner. R legally, I'm still Marius Soska, but uh, that'll be changed soon. And uh, to the Soskas, I say so long. Thanks, well, Jeremiah. <laughs> no worries. Marius Stoner, take a bong rip there. Oh, yeah, that's right. You got a lighter hand? Yeah, 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 there. Yeah, yeah. So... take that bong rip. And uh, what we're going to do, actually, after Marius is done taking this bong rip, I'm going to play a video from a band called Diamonds. Now, I just sort of found this band. I stumbled across the awesome lead singer and the rest of the crew at this year's Hemp Fest. They were backstage, and, uh, oh yeah, there you go. And uh, I thought, when I, when I first saw them, I was like lamely thinking they were some R&B band or something. But actually, they're like a classic metal-influenced rockin' band, and they kick some serious ass. So I wanted to play a couple videos on the show today. They were in Vancouver last night. I didn't get a chance to go see them. I wish I could have. But I, I like their videos, and we're going to play a couple of them for you today. This first one is called Livin' Tonight. I'm going to throw that up for you. And when we get back, we'll have Jeff from Skunk Funk on the show. And after that, we'll have Dana Larson from Sensible BC. So come on back after this.
guys feel that? The fucking the power of Merlin? Look at that. There you go. Yeah, fucking get ready. Who's going? Oh, oh. That's how it's done. Woo! Then you put like all the groupies in here. Yeah. Right? They're all doing fucking handstands. <laughs> Killing time. Happy 420. Right on the money. That means we're gonna have to smoke another bong rip. Yeah. We forgot about that before the video. Jeez, we're we're definitely stoners here, even by name. Marius Stoner. Yeah, we're trying to hook up the whole Skype situation. That's why you're not seeing this. But why isn't it working? We tried to get it working during the thing here. It just doesn't want to work for some reason. Open, open. Um, yeah, camera's all ready to go. Everything should be working. It was working until we just had a problem with it, as usual. There's a technical difficulty right when we go to use it. That's how this show works, man. Yeah. Mix has just heard Marius' yeah. phone alarm. Mix uh, in the audience right now, in the chat, but he's also on the other end of the Skype call that we were just on. But uh, yet we can't, why won't this open? Something strange is going on. Make sure exposed. Can you try and do this, Marius? Yeah. Okay. I think uh, what, we, what we'll do, since um, that actually should only take a second. I don't want to have to switch things around. Let's just do it the regular way. I'm taking this bong rip. I don't know, where is, where is the Skype one now? Just open the finder window. Search for Skype. Smoking the Burmese. Th that's actually from Mick. Yeah, and Mick, uh, if you guys are out there watching the show right now with Jeff, uh, I need you to tell me if you guys can hear me when we open up because that seemed to be the problem is that uh, you guys couldn't hear me. So we're going to get this thing set up, but maybe uh, we'll okay, go. We could. Oh, okay. It's uh, well, don't, I won't say that on the air, but hold on just a second. Yep. Why don't we play while we're waiting for this whole thing? Um, I did an interview yesterday with Kayla Blanford, who is the first person to ever be arrested for possession, uh, ch or charged with possession, arrested and charged with possession, inside a Canadian vapor lounge. We haven't heard of any other ones before. Nobody's been arrested in our lounge, none in the Toronto lounges that we know of for possession. So this is setting a weird precedent here. The cops just came in and started screwing with her for seemingly no reason. Um, so maybe we can load that one up. And uh, check this video. This is the segment I just sat with her yesterday and recorded. And when we get back, we'll play the actual arrest video itself. Check it out. So I'm sitting here with Kayla Blandford, and she recently was the first Canadian, actually, you became the first Canadian to be busted inside a vapor lounge for marijuana possession. And this was at the Hotbox Cafe in Toronto, which is a cool place. We've been there before, we were there on our last trip. But uh, Kayla, maybe you want to tell viewers about what happened there. Sure. Um, I've been working at Hotbox for well over a year. Uh, and then I decided to move to BC recently. And uh, I had just finished my job. It had been like a couple days that I was off work. And uh, yeah, I, I went into Hotbox to just charge my iPod. And I was sitting there with a couple friends. Um, I had just been ready to roll a joint. I had a little bit of weed on the table and my back was turned towards uh, the door where the police walked in so I didn't see them. And I'm absolutely unsure as to why they targeted me, but 
They came in, started asking me about my weed. I showed them my Compassion Club card, which I have doctor's prescription for. That's the only way that I even have access to it. Um, and yeah, I showed them how the numbers on my bags correspond to the number on my card. And um, yeah, they, they just decided that if I wasn't willing to let them search me illegally, then I would have to be arrested. So that's the decision that they took. And um, yeah, it, it was really so stupid. There was, you don't know why they targeted you. This was just out of nowhere, basically. There was really no justification, no reason for it. They just stumbled in off the street. And yeah. then for some reason, maybe were you the first person in their path they saw with pot? Uh, right away, I noticed that they looked around the group, and I think that they were trying to target, in a sense, like the youngest, weakest person, which is really unfortunate that that was me because they don't understand that I know my rights, I know what's going on. So it was a really stupid idea on their part. Um, I'm not sure why they came after me, uh, but I was the only person that they really talked to. They let my friends and everyone else go, and uh, yeah, I was the only person that they searched. So. And so they wanted to search you further. They wanted to search your bag, but you said no. Yeah, because I know that they don't have the right to. There's absolutely no reason why they have to go in my bag, and I was fully cooperating the entire time. So. Yeah, and they said we'd arrest you, and then because you resisted, they did arrest you. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and so and they brought you in, didn't they? Yeah. So tell people about. You've already told me a little bit about this, and it's pretty gruesome. But tell me about what happened. Uh, yeah, they definitely humiliated me and bullied me in front of everyone at Hotbox that had me just waiting in the handcuffs. Um, I was wearing a headband that sort of had spikes along the top, like it's a choker, but I just wear it as a headband, they totally just pulled it off my head. Um, yeah, when they brought me out to the street, they just had me wait a while, because it was bike cops. They just kind of came in off the street, decided to bust someone and then leave with them. Um, so people in the street were kind of yelling, asking the police why it was happening, why they were going after me. And I, I felt really good that people were standing up for me, because I definitely was very angry. And the more upset you get, the more they take it as you're resisting and it becomes dangerous to you. Like, I don't want to be in a further, scarier situation if I'm just yelling at them, which is what I wanted to do the entire time. Um, so yeah, they put me in the back of the cruiser and they brought me down to 14 Division. And uh, yeah, I had a level three strip search and I, I keep joking to myself, that's the closest to a threesome I've been yet. So <laughs> like, it sucks, but... And uh, what is level three exactly? Do you know what that means? Um, I mean, you don't necessarily need to describe it for us, but is that the, level three is a high one or is yeah, level one no, the highest? Yeah, no, it's the yeah, it level is the highest. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So that's not a good one. Then. No. Yeah. No. Um, and basically, uh, they charged me with possession, and I only had ten grams on me. And they thought that I was a, a big drug dealer. They thought that I was making money off the pot that I was selling. And yeah, the the. I don't know, one of the worst parts to me is definitely the fact that they automatically, as soon as they saw the weed, decided to start treating me like I was a dangerous criminal, and it doesn't make any sense. I kept telling the police that I didn't understand why they were arresting me, and I didn't understand the reasons behind it, because cannabis is not harmful, we know this. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really upset because it's, I'm not suddenly a criminal because I decided that I would rather go a natural way rather than taking pharmaceutical, antidepressant, anti-anxiety medication. That's the difference for me. So yeah, I think it's absolutely unfair. Once I like, was interrogated, they decided that um, yes, I obviously use it medicinally and for them to take away my card and for them to withhold me from my medication was very unfair. What sucks is I'm still charged with possession, um, but they did end up charge or dropping a lot of the charges. So because at first they wanted to charge you with a whole ridiculous gamut of things, yeah, and then they just dropped it down to the yeah, um, uh, yeah, the charging with possession, and then in order to release me, I just had to promise to appear in court in September. So wow. And I hope that they'll drop these ridiculous charges. You're a medical patient. Now, you don't have an MMAR card, but you do have a note from a doctor that you use to get your, your uh, dispensary card. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. 
Hmm. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that that happened to you. I guess you're going to have to keep in touch with us to tell us uh, what's you know going on in the future with this case for sure. Yeah. And so you were going to move to Vancouver, and now they're kind of keeping you in Toronto. Are you plan still planning to move here? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm in the middle of painting my room right now. Oh, so. Okay. All right. So the move is <laughs> I'm still like permanently happening here. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, it's good to have you in Vancouver as well. Thank you. Really but that'll make it easier for you to come back on the show soon. Yeah, yeah for sure. On. It will be like right after my court date that I'll be back, so. Wow, and so there's no, you don't actually, again, there's really no reason why they'd go after you. You know, you, do you think they might be following you for some reason? This was just totally random, you think? Um, yeah, it felt like it because they, when I was being interrogated, they were asking me about Compassion Club, and they're like, oh, so you just go here and smoke up, like trying to make jokes out of it? Wow. And I really got the sense that they didn't know about any of it. Like, they didn't understand. They didn't even really know about, like, the rules and regulations around the MMAR exemption. So, yeah, they definitely were rookies. And I think that maybe a, a boss or someone with authority may have suggested go bust go bust someone in Hotbox. Wow. So, yeah, I know that um, with Hotbox, um, sort of moving locations. There's like a little bit of a tr transition happening right now. Um, and there's been a lot of drama, you could say, um, with the new owners, uh, not of Hotbox, but of the other cafe that's coming in and Hotbox. So I think a lot of people feel that it was almost fueled like that I was narked out in a sense. And I don't know if I believe it, I just think that I happened to be in a really weird situation. Um, I don't know anyone else that's been busted at a cafe. I hope that I it doesn't happen. I, I can't think of anybody across the country that's ever been busted for possession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and uh, yeah, like the worst part is is that like it, it, it's dried flower tops. Even if I had hemp, which has such a low THC content, if any, I would still be in trouble. I would still be considered a criminal. and. That's not the Canada that we should be living in. Like, that's our planet's best resource, and the amount of time and money that's wasted on it, like fighting, oh, it's No, it's a ridiculous, a the off. drug war is the biggest waste of money. It's just a constant, perpetual flushing of money down the toilet. Yeah. Wow, and so Hotbox is actually in a move right now to a new location, and I guess, as you said, maybe there was some sort of battle with the landlord that sparked maybe a complaint or something. We see that a lot of times when police go after people, it's based on a complaint. So I wonder if maybe, exactly as you said, you got your heart go. Hmm. Yeah. We never so. know. It could be anything. It could be random. Yeah. But again, it seems a little strange that uh, it's never happened. This would be the first time that we've ever seen it at any sort of lounge. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, you're, you're breaking new ground here. <laughs> Yeah. At least your original. The the yeah. police didn't understand why I wasn't just smoking at home. And I had to explain to them that if I'm not allowed to smoke in my apartment building, then the landlord's going to call the police. It's still going to happen. Right. If I'm at Hotbox, the smell's concealed, I'm off the street, I'm away from families, I'm away from kids. So I, I really don't get it. Like To me, this is where you really understand how stupid prohibition is because I'm right in the gray scale. I'm a medical user, but I don't have my MMAR exemption, but I still have doctor's prescriptions, so I'm still a criminal. Yeah, it just, no. there's so many loose ends, and that's that's the truth, is it doesn't make sense, so. Well, I think you should fight it or, you know, figure out a way, one way or another, and see what happens. I mean, because who knows, you are a medical patient, and there's been a lot with the Murnau case and with some other cases yeah, recently. absolutely. You know, you haven't been able to get your MMAR necessarily. You just, have you tried to get it? Um, no, because the agreement that I had with my doctor was that I would be using cannabis as my medicine for a decent amount of time, and then he would see how, you know, he would monitor my use. Right. So that I'm kind of in that period right now. Right. Um, yeah, like with the Murnau case, it proves the comparisons between pharmaceuticals and cannabis. It proves that there isn't enough access for medical patients. It's so many things that they've addressed there, you know, definitely apply to me here. So if I could fight the charges, I, I definitely would want to. Well, it's a bizarre situation where your doctor is giving you a note to go get marijuana, even though he or she rightly knows that it's illegal. Yeah. And you're using an illegal substance because without your MMAR, you still are illegal. 
And I mean, as we saw, you didn't even have you had 10 grams on you or something. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's no, even... for, to, yeah, to even charge someone for possession of 10 grams wow. and to think that I was trafficking, like. Oh, that's really ridiculous. Oh, and an insult. Just, I know, it's such a small amount. And it's because you had some cash on you too or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, anyone at any time could be carrying around, like, you just got their paycheck cash. Like, yeah. there's. It, it doesn't mean reasons. that I'm... Because you have money doesn't mean they yeah. assume you're a drug dealer. Like, yeah. my goodness. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, or I, a marijuana dealer. No, definitely. <laughs> I I hope that this doesn't happen to other people, like in Toronto and Canada, like around the world. But it really pisses me off that in my situation, like, I was privileged. They didn't bother me and they didn't harass me that bad. But really, it should never even happen in the first place. So... Right. Well, I say, uh, you know, the whole process of the strip search and keeping them locked up for a period, that's traumatizing in a way, too. I mean, that's really a violation of your rights, and it shouldn't be done over flowers. No, absolutely not. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, for coming on the show. Yeah, and, no uh, Now, you had a video of the experience, right? There's, like, something, somebody was recording with a camera. Yeah, there's a few different videos uh, from a couple different people, so... Well, we'll scoop those, and we'll play them on the show with this clip as well. Sure. Fair awesome. Enough. So we'll have you back soon to talk about what's been happening with the case. And uh, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we're, now we're going to play the video itself, actually. Marius, let's throw that on. This is the video of Kayla being arrested. Just a short clip. <laughs> and then we'll come back with these guys. When you get I to the station, understand. I don't understand why you would come well, up here and do this. I'm doing nothing station, wrong. I'm not being violent. I'm cooperating. You can talk to a lawyer and you'll have reasonable access to a telephone. And we can discuss that uh, further there, okay? But at this point, right here, we have proceeds of crime. We have uh, marijuana and the amount that uh, can be additional distribution. Okay? We I understand am, that. No, I don't understand because I'm not distributing cannabis. I do not do that. We can talk further at the station, okay? You are charged with, as I said, possession for the purpose of distributing the proceeds of crime. You are not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so, but whatever you say may be given into evidence. Do you understand that? Yes. If you wish to say anything, then it's just a uh, charge. Yes, I don't understand why you would come in here and do this. I'm doing nothing wrong. There's nothing harmful about cannabis. You need to figure out how much is the amount that you have on you that's wrong. It's going to be food from it. the poisonous tree. Okay. You can film it. It's and you haven't stated your No, name. you need to state it. Okay. So now, you know that her, everything will be thrown out because it's fruit from the poisonous okay. tree because you've not stated sure it is. your badge number. Yep. So yeah, and we've, we've got that you so haven't stated it and you won't state it. Please continue to enforce. You fucked up things on people all over. One second. All right. So, wow. It's kind of weird that they just came in and went right after her for seemingly no reason. It's strange. I guess they were just looking for a fight. Now it's her tact. Yeah. All right, well, we have here two gentlemen in front of me, Jeff Lundstrom from Skunk Funk in Saskatoon, also uh, hosting the, the Prairie, what is it, Prairie Medicinal Harvest Cup, Harvest Cup. the They're second right. annual. And sitting next to him is Mr. McMahon from Opus Live on Pod TV. What's up, McMahon? Hey, guys. Uh, wow, it sure is easy to get to Saskatoon from our neck of the woods. Yeah, you were just at my house this morning. I was at your and house this morning, and now you're there. Uh, I got up, and here I am uh, sitting with Jeff. We're uh, getting some good medication going on here. We're heavily medicated, and uh, and actually just celebrated, just celebrated like 420 at your end. Nice. Because uh, I noticed my computer and my phones went off along with your guys' phones and alarms, and so we were your 420 up. alarm. We were doing the 420 puff down heavy. That's right, that's the BC420 alarm. And actually, Mick, I'm smoking some Burmese right now, thanks to you. The I heard that earlier, yeah, the, uh, the wake and bake uh, uh, buds that I left you there. He left a few little nuggets sitting on uh, the dresser. Thanks, Mick. Hey, yeah, right Mick stayed, had to stay at my house last night on the way to the airport. Of course, he's from the island, so he crashed on the couch, the old Burnaby mansion. Yeah, Jay, at Jay on the lake's place. That's right, right on the lake. Um... <laughs> So, yeah, Jeff, I want to talk to you, of course, about what's happening in Saskatoon this weekend. Monday, or it's actually Sunday and Monday. Sunday, Monday this weekend. But we're going to be partying from now until Monday for sure. 
That's right. And there's going to be a little something happening on Saturday as well with Mick and you guys at the store. Yeah, but let's, you betcha. Let's yeah. talk about what's going on, the big event. Uh, the second annual Prairie Medicinal Harvest Cup. Uh, second year we're hosting the event here in Saskatoon. Uh, I personally feel, and amongst the others, that uh, Saskatchewan has some of the best pot growers in the country. And uh, we're celebrating and getting together to make sure that uh, everybody knows that that's the truth. Awesome, I'll be man. here to verify. <laughs> uh -huh. And so you have a number of strains from, I guess, uh, across Canada, but a bunch of them are actually from Saskatoon. Yeah, there's five that are from Saskatchewan, oh, specifically sick. from Saskatchewan growers that are in this year's uh, uh, event. So we're really happy to be featuring uh, Saskatchewan medicinal growers and making sure that the patients uh, get facilitated with those growers so that they can have the medicine they, we all know they need. And so um, there's going to be musical acts there, and you got other things going on. What what's on the agenda? Uh, there's live entertainment uh, for both nights. You bet you we got a rock and roll night, uh, and we got a hip hop night. It's excellent fun. Uh, we also uh, got some great catered food in the house. Uh, we got uh, guest speakers uh, across the board. Uh, some of the people um, are like uh, Neil Magnuson from the Freedom Tour. Uh, yeah, we got uh, we got uh, Tamara Cartwright, who's uh, activist from Alberta. Uh, Jada Ridge, an activist from Manitoba. Uh, we got Robert Godfrey, uh, one of the founding members of the Saskatchewan Marijuana Party. Uh, we got Dr. Paul Hornsby in the house. Uh, you know, everybody's just uh, coming together to make this happen, and it's a beautiful event and great sponsors. And we're just so happy to be doing this, and happy that uh, you guys, as always, help out so much with. Uh, having us on the shows and promoting the stuff on CC, so don't think that that doesn't go unappreciated. I love you guys. I respect everything you do, and uh, we're going to keep it happening here in Saskatchewan until the end of time, until they legalize this plan, and we can all just get stoned, and it don't matter. Awesome, man. Well, we love you too, Jeff. You're doing a lot of hard work out there on the prairies. You're, right at the, you're basically the center of the whole deal there in uh, Saskatchewan, so what you're doing there is also much appreciated. But, Jeff, I, we were talking yesterday. Uh, there's a little article on the front page of Cannabis Culture right now about the event. And uh, I quoted you as talking about why you were putting this event on in the first place and what it was really about. Maybe you want to talk a little bit more about uh, why you wanted to do this event in the first place. Well, as uh, people know, it's, uh, I've been a DG grower now for five years for the federal government. Uh, my health patients need the medicine. I've struggled to get my own license. I was denied seven times in seven years in Saskatchewan. Um, you know, I became very compassionate about helping people who suffer with cancer and MS as I uh, started to grow for people. Um, basically having this event is to make sure that the, the people who are sick get it facilitated with the growers of the medicine that they need. So that's, I'm just compassionate about that really truly happening. And uh, like I said, we grow the best weed, so why not have it happen here? Allegedly. Who <laughs> grows the best weed? Uh. <laughs> Well, yeah. he said, Mick will find out, you know, and it'll be uh, glorious, I guarantee. You guys won't be disappointed, and for all you Pod TV viewers, we're live at the event Sunday, Monday uh, with Opus, and I really hope people tune in, and if you can't be here this year, we really want to see you out next year, and that's an open invitation to everybody in that room right there, and all my friends from CC, you guys come out next year, and we'll show you a good time, I promise. And uh, let's awesome. at, uh, Jeremiah, this is a Pod TV event like we've never broadcast live from Saskatchewan no That's we a, never have no, yes man. this will be the oh. first time Pod TV Saskatchewan's on the map so <laughs> this History. Be. tomorrow afternoon we'll be uh, broadcasting live here at Skunk Funk I'll be uh, well hanging out in the front of the shop and I guess uh, hopefully interviewing customers if they want when they come in maybe you know maybe have a few people on and uh We'll probably, I think Jeff probably can crack out a bong I can use here. Oh, guaranteed. Uh, who knows? Maybe we'll get some vape and we'll see what other kind of shenanigans we can get on in the front room and uh, say, yeah, we're going to rock this place. It'll be a party. Awesome. A, little bit, a little bit of BC stuff. I must say, though, you know, you can drive like for like 20 blocks in this town and not see a Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> well, we got a couple of them. They're, they're around, but you have to look. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you bump into them. That's funny. It's not like you go in to buy pants and there's like, oh, Starbucks is in here. <laughs> <laughs> they do make Try a different coffee. coffee shop. There's got to be others. That, I like the mom and pop coffee shops better anyway. Well, um, I was in a rush and, you know, I was like. Yeah, I guess when you know here, it. Man. it was like I found a Starbucks in Mississippi when I went to visit Mark 
uh, because all the other coffee shops were closed, and we could only find one, and it was inside a Target. That's the only one we could find. <laughs> <laughs> Target and Starbucks, hey, they're in bed together. So this is the first time for Pod TV in Saskatchewan, but Rom mentioned in the comments that nobody has ever broadcast live from, Sask- from Saskatchewan. <laughs> Not just Pod TV, but well, you know. We, we, we've been talking about trying to change that. As you know, I've been uh, working on uh, getting a segment happening with you guys, and uh, that's maybe something we can look for that's forward right. to the future, right? Yeah. yeah, you've got wooden cameras there still. You guys need some upgrading, and yeah, <laughs> cow- yeah, yeah. You can watch your dog run away for two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Cow patty oh, clocks, cow patty things clocks. Like that. That's right. We live in igloos. Cow yeah. patty cameras. I think I saw a photo hut. <laughs> Huh. So let's talk a little bit. <coughs> pardon me. Let's talk a little bit, Jeff, about last year's event. How did it go for the first annual event? Well, you know, uh, getting this type of event off the ground, as everybody knows, is, is something uh, that takes a, a little bit of special effort and a definite uh, drive to uh, to want the desire to see it happen. So last year was uh, was a great event. It was a good starting point. Uh, it gave us a direction and a goal of what we wanted to see for the future. So um, last year, I feel, was a complete success. I think this year is going to be an even bigger success, and I look forward to the future of the Prairie Cup here in the, in, in the Flatlands. Awesome, man. Well, it should be fun. I'm excited to see what happens this weekend. And so what time tomorrow are you guys starting? It's Saturday the, is the sort of uh, skunk funk meet and greet that you yeah. guys are going to be chilling at. What We're time's that? We're going to start broadcasting like probably for around 4, maybe 3.34, your guys' time, which would be 4.35 here, so. Or 5.3. Yeah. That's, so. that's very confusing. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, say that again. It was 3. Shoot, we're shooting for 4.20 BC time. So. 4.20 BC time, that's perfect. Which would be, around, would, would be around 4, which would be 5 o'clock here, uh, Saskatchewan time. Excellent. Yeah, okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll put all that up in the lot. show I'm notes. Around, uh, I was thinking, uh, I'm taking a bong right yeah, yeah, that'd be a little bit early, but yeah, four. Okay, yeah. So we'll be on at three o'clock, the same time as my show in BC. Three o'clock in BC, we're coming on at four here. Yeah. Right. And so, are you gonna film? A, well, you're not gonna film the entire event, but you're gonna show the different strains and go through some of that stuff. I guess like the Kush Cup, huh, Mick? Yeah, pretty much. I'll uh, basically, I I just got an itinerary here. What I'll do is I'll look up, I'll call you tonight, and uh, and I'll do that. I, all right, well, uh, which ones will probably broadcast? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you have to be a medical patient to attend? Uh, we we prefer that people ha- have their cards, I mean, of course, but we encourage uh, people that are looking to find out about the medicinal program and to find people who have experience with uh, dealing with the program and how to facilitate them and all those people are going to be in the house so even if you're not coming and you don't have a card in your back pocket you're looking to get a card and we're going to help you try and find that cool all right but so you can does that mean you can buy a you can buy a ticket if you're not of course my brother we got we don't discriminate good i'm glad to hear (laughs) excellent we're Uh, a group of people that accept and uh and and spread the love so Fantastic. I'm glad to hear it, man. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on again. And uh, Mick, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank and, you. And uh, have a good one. I wish I could be there with you guys. but Next year. Yeah, I'll be in the chat checking you guys out. And next year, yeah, that'd be I'm fun. I'm going to put you we'll on the spot right now, brother. You're coming next year. Even if I got a paper. We should do a road trip. <laughs> we should drive out there in a big pot TV van. Hell yeah. That would be fun. That's what I want to do. For sure. For film sure, the whole brother. way. All right. You thanks, guys. guys. Much appreciated. We'll see you guys soon. Peace. All right, guys. Thanks. And thanks. Uh, we'll be talking to you tomorrow live uh, here at Pot TV. Cultivate oh. your freedom. Peace. So, Marius, why don't we play another Diamonds video and then we'll bring Dana on right afterwards? All right. Sounds good. Throw it on, my friend. <laughs> Welcome back, all you punkers, thrashers, and rockers. Diamonds have made it across the big, mean city to get what's theirs. But they are not alone. Looks like a tight spot, Diamonds. Here's a little song I'm playing just for you. It's called Take On The Night.
It looks like these cats weren't too far from their turf after all, and they got their ride back. Have a good trip home, diamonds. Diamonds, they're awesome. Hard rock and shit. Dana, Dana Hello, Larson, Jeremiah. back on the program once again. Uh, Always good, good to have there. you. It, it looks like maybe your head is going to be cut off here, Marius. Maybe you want to give him a little bit more headspace and pan so out just, just a, uh, he can, can just stand like yeah, this. Pretend you're walking down the stairs. You were cut off too. So. Yeah. Why would they have the camera solo? Yeah, because you're also uh, getting I'm cut off. Vertically challenged. Oh, there, there we go. Yeah, that, that's good. there you go. Beautiful. All right. So Dana, and your latest project. You have many projects, but your latest this project. Is this, this is, is a, a great very one. Exciting one. I think it will be very important for the uh, cannabis movement in BC and ultimately across Canada. And it's something called Sensible BC. And we're online at sensiblebc.ca. And uh, the idea behind this is to try to make some change at the provincial level. <clears throat> to recognize that uh, control of policing and the administration of justice is all provincial jurisdiction and that when cannabis is legalized or decriminalized or taken out of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, it becomes provincial jurisdiction in the same way alcohol and tobacco. There could be federal laws around it too, like with alcohol and tobacco, the labeling on tobacco is federal and there's importation and exportation laws, but the age of consent, the point of sale, the distribution, all that is decided by each province by themselves. Yeah. And so cannabis is going to be something along the same lines when we achieve our goal. So the Sensible BC, uh, it's to promote what we, a legislation we've written called the Sensible Policing Act. And the Sensible Policing Act is provincial legislation that does a few different things. And the main thing it does is to essentially decriminalize simple possession of marijuana. And it does that by amending the Police Act, which, which uh, controls uh, all the police in British Columbia. And it amends that act to redirect the police from spending any resources, including their own member time, on uh, searching, seizing, investigating, detaining, uh, uh, or uh, penalizing anybody for simple possession of cannabis. And uh, to deal with the question of uh, youth, we uh, decided to put in there that... Um, uh, uh, that under the Alcohol Control Act, the Liquor Control Act, which has penalties and regulations for youth in possession of alcohol, we added cannabis in there to that with the stipulation that penalties could not be any greater. So a police officer, a youth who was in possession of cannabis without like a medical need or something like that, a police officer could confiscate it just like they could confiscate alcohol and they could write a ticket uh, if they chose to do so for a fine. Uh, right. But it's not a criminal record in the same sense as it would be under the current law. So it's a reduction, but it still enables police to deal with youth while leaving adults alone who are just in simple possession of cannabis. And the fines would be based on what, the same as the alcohol. The same as the fines. alcohol. The, pen, the, the way the law is written is that the penalties cannot be any greater than they are for alcohol. So it would right. be basically the same thing. We're not looking to add penalties to youth or to penalize youth extra, but I think most people would agree that if you're under 18, uh, you shouldn't be smoking cannabis uh, without at least parental consent in your own home. But doing it publicly, if a police officer sees you, they should be able to confiscate it and take it away and, and deal with that in the same way as alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you are allowed to drink alcohol in your own home if your parents do that. So it would be similar to cannabis. But, uh, but that's what we're looking at for the, for the decriminalization part of this, of this legislation. But it also goes further than that because we recognize that that's not the final solution to the whole cannabis issue, but it's a good first step and it's a good way of recognizing that what we're doing now is wrong. You know, we can all agree that people who use cannabis uh, and aren't breaking any other laws or rules and being responsible, they should be left alone and not be bothered by the police and it's not the best way to spend limited police resources. I think there's a broad consensus on that. 
Now, what this legislation also does is it mandates the Attorney General of British Columbia to contact the federal government, write them a letter, and officially request that they either take cannabis right out of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act or just give British Columbia an exemption, perhaps under Section 56, which allows the federal government to give an exemption to any of the drug laws for scientific research, for medical research, or just for the public interest. And so we want them to, to ask the federal government to let British Columbia go our own way when it comes to marijuana policy. And then at the same time, we want the province to initiate a commission, a study, to figure out what are the laws and regulations and rules for legalized cannabis going to be in British Columbia when the federal government says yes? What should the age limit be? Should people be able to grow their own plants at home? If so, how many? How do we deal with medical cannabis? Should that be taxed or not taxed or distributed differently? How do we deal? What's the model for public sale for access? I'm not sure I have the answer to all those things. I know what we're doing now is a terrible policy and I know that people shouldn't go to jail for growing or using marijuana in a safe way, but I'm not sure how much it should be taxed or how many plants there should be and we're going it'll be a transitional thing as well but we want the province to figure out those rules and regulations to talk about it and to move the debate beyond simply if we should change the laws but right. rather what are we going to change them to let's figure that out well and we need to get to that next step because as you see in other places like in washington state they're battling with that as they go and it'd be nice to get some of that out of the way as early as possible yeah, no, I mean, it, it is a challenge, you know, and there is, there's idealists and different people with different agendas in the cannabis movement that have different ideas about what the laws should be. Um, but I think this legislation is put together in such a way that we can all agree that people who possess marijuana and aren't bothering anybody else should be left alone. And I think that there's a broad consensus beyond just the cannabis movement and those that are watching here that that, you know, polls show 70, 80 percent in British Columbia would agree with that statement, depending how you ask it. And then so there's no uh, five nanogram limits in this bill. Nothing is there? like that. It doesn't, it doesn't change any of the laws in any sense. It doesn't change any of the laws at all. What it does is it tells BC police, leave people alone if they're just smoking marijuana and not doing anything else. Don't spend any of your money, including your own time. Don't use any government resources to bother, search, seize, detain, arrest, or anything people who are in civil possession. So it doesn't. So it doesn't change the law, and it doesn't, you know, add any extra penalties or do anything like that. There's no, you know, and that's a debate that needs to be had. But I think it's better to have that after we've agreed as a province that this is the, you know, so we, so. So what this legislation, with this legislation, what we can do is we'd like to see it passed by the Liberal government in power now or whatever government we have after, the, after this provincial election coming up uh, next spring. But uh, we've also realized we've got to make this happen ourselves. And so we're working towards a provincial referendum, a ballot initiative referendum of, to have a vote on this issue. And I feel that this is exactly the kind of stuff that a referendum system was really designed for. And a referendum is similar to the way that the ballot initiatives are done in the United States on a state level. But here in British Columbia, it's a little bit different. And it's, it might be hard in some ways, isn't it's, it? Uh, ours is Difficult. harder. The, the, the rules yeah. and laws in British Columbia to have a referendum are harder than any American state. It's a very, very steep hill to climb. And, um, and as a result of that, we've only ever had one successful vote ever since this legislation was brought in back in the 90s. And that was for the HST. And a few others have tried, but no one's even come close aside from the HST camp or the anti-HST campaign and getting a referendum on the ballot. It's very difficult. Yeah. The rules are such that you have only 90 days to collect signatures. You only have three months to collect signatures. You can't pay anybody to collect signatures. And um, you need to get 10% of the registered voters in every single riding in the province to sign on to your initiative. If you dismiss one riding, then your initiative fails. So it's a very difficult campaign. Uh, but that being said, those people are out there for us. We have a broad base of support. The cannabis issue's got you know 60 to 80 percent support, depending how you ask the question and what you're looking for, right? So people are out there, yeah. and that's why we're doing this campaign in a very special way that no one's ever really tried before. No one's ever taken this strategy because there's fixed election dates for the referendum. So the next referendum, no matter when the signatures are gathered by, the next referendum will be in September 2014. Uh, that's just how the system works. And so anything that gets enough signatures by early 2014 could qualify. And so our goal is not to start collecting signatures right now. We're launching the campaign around now over the next few weeks. We're going to start getting media attention. But our goal is to spend a year in advance, a whole year, getting volunteers on board and pre-registering people so that we're asking you to go to our website at sensiblebc.ca and if you would sign the petition, the official one, when the time comes for the ballot initiative next fall, 
then we want you to register now. And then next fall, in September, October, November of 2013, is when we'll actually do the official signature gathering campaign. And so by then, we need to have hundreds of thousands of people who have registered at our website. And we need to have thousands upon thousands of volunteers all across the province who are ready to go, who want to collect those signatures for us, the official ones and the official forms, when the time comes. And that'll be September, October, November 2013 is how we're working towards that right now. Yeah. If we succeed in getting enough signatures at that time, then the referendum would happen in September 2014. And then it would be up to whatever government was in power to actually pass that legislation into law. Our system also, it's not like in California where it becomes law and the government can't change it and it's really strictly in there. Under our system, the legislation then goes to the government in third reading and the government in power could still change it or mess with it. But there's a, a, intense political pressure at that point to move forward. And, you know, as an NDP member, I'm hoping we have an NDP government by then. But regardless of whether we do or not, I mean, the federal liberals have also endorsed an excellent marijuana policy. And there's a lot of federal liberals and B.C. liberals. So, I mean, there's no reason this isn't really a partisan issue or a partisan campaign. It's mm -hmm. definitely a lot of people who are conservatives and right wingers and libertarians and socialists and and of all political stripes can agree on this issue, you know? So our goal isn't to make this a left or a right wing kind of thing or a partisan campaign. But, but what I'm asking people who are watching this is to go to sensiblebc.ca and to sign yourself up. But more importantly, bug all your friends and family. You can order from us also physical sign-up forms so you can sign up people. You can start going door to door and talking to your neighbors, talking to your friends and family, going to your school, going to concerts and events, going everywhere and getting people to register and sign up who will support this because it's going to be a monumental effort to get these signatures next, next fall. And so we're going to need uh, people registered so we can just go, instead of going and knocking on random doors at that point, we already have everybody lined up and we can just go to the homes and places of people who have already promised to sign and get them to sign the official forms. And in that three month period, we can put those forms everywhere and just have anybody sign them that's a member of this or a, a person who lives in this province, is that correct? Yes, it's, it's, they make it trickier than that because it's got to be divided up by riding. So you have to, you, when, you, when you submit the forms, you submit them for each riding. So the person right. has to know where they live and put, them, put it on the right form. Oh. So in, in some rural areas, it's easier because everybody's in the same riding in the same town. When you're in downtown Vancouver, people are coming here from 12 different ridings that are all in the downtown area. So they need to know their postal code and we need to have the forms and things like that sorted out by postal code and organized in that way. And certainly, even when the campaign time comes, we'll still have them available everywhere. But right now, people can just sign up, give us their information, and we'll figure out where they are. We'll organize it, and we'll make sure that we get your proper signature when the time comes. So right now, we're just collecting signatures. Uh, not so much signatures, but names, addresses, postal codes, email addresses, so that we can stay in touch with you. And hopefully, if you're watching this, you're a devoted uh, cannabis enthusiast, and you actually want to volunteer for the campaign, and you want to get, get your friends to sign up and start promoting this. We have banner ads that you can use on our webpage to put on your site. You can always just link to us from Facebook and on Twitter and that kind of thing. And, uh, and get the word out there. We've got a lot of exciting things coming up over the next year to keep us in the media. We've got different endorsements we're gonna be rolling out. We've got studies that we're doing into the cost of enforcing cannabis prohibition and the prohibition against civil possession in British Columbia. Uh, people don't know a lot of the facts. You know that British Columbia, uh, the number of people charged for simple possession of cannabis in British Columbia has doubled between 2005 and 2010. And that's the, the, where the last year statistics are available for. It'll be interesting to see what was happening last year, but it's steadily risen every single year. Before that, it was pretty consistent. It would go up and down a little bit, but there wasn't any trend in a particular direction. And charges for trafficking and production and importation and exportation have not gone up or down. In fact, mm. production charges have actually dropped somewhat in BC. Less people are being charged for production. They're picking which is, the low-hanging fruit. But they're definitely, absolutely, and, they're, and because they've got more police and crime is going down in general, marijuana smokers, you can always arrest more of those, especially in BC. Yeah. And so we're seeing a lot of charges uh, being happening against people for simple possession in BC. What's going on, Marius? There's a question from the chat. Okay. Um, Yoda wants to know, how will decriminalization turn into legalization? Well, that's what this act has got these two parts to it, right? So we're asking in the second part of the act, we're asking the federal government, please 
Can you let British Columbia go a different way? Now, Stephen Harper and his team are probably not going to say yes to that, right? However, it's good that we're asking, and it makes a point as a province, and he's not going to be in power forever. And I hope that in 2015, 2015, when we have our next election, which will only be about six months after we've had our glorious victory in this referendum, we'll see a change in government. Perhaps we'll see an NDP or Liberal or NDP Liberal coalition or something like that. And it would be, I think it'd be very uh, possible that we could have a referendum victory in BC with an NDP government in power and then an NDP or liberal uh, coalition type government in the federal level. And I think that could be the, a, a positive set of circumstances to actually get legislative change. Right. But illegally, there's a limit to what BC can do as a province, but I think decriminalizing dispossession definitely sends a strong message and is a good first step. He also wants to know, um, can you challenge the DUI provision after the fact? Um, that's not in our legislation, right? He's talking about the Washington one. Uh, and I don't no. know, I know that in California, legislation that you pass by referendum there is like enshrined for a period of time and no one can make changes to it in that way. I don't know if Washington's the same way or not. Maybe you know a little bit more. You were just down there. Yeah, I know. no, I, you can definitely legislate some of the parts out of it. The, actually, they've already put a bill forward to do just that, to take medical marijuana users out of that DUI provision. But that bill was premature because the bill, it actually hasn't gone forward yet. So they're assuming that that will come up again in the next... Oh, okay, uh, but there is a possibility then of, of right. amending it for things like that. You, there is, but changes. now you can't have another initiative for two years to change those rules. But it'll, it has to be there for at least two years. But you can legislate parts of it out. So it's kind of like a loophole or some right, way of getting okay. around it, right? You can't have another... You don't have, keep on having referendums every six months and reverse each other. Exactly. So that. they have a two-year limit, right. I guess. Or well, that's... I mean, I, <clears throat> I know it's a d different thing, and, then we, and that's that, that some of the American ones have been controversial for different reasons and that's why I'm hoping this is something that we don't have that division I really tried to reach out to all different elements both in the cannabis community and we talked to law enforcement officers we talked to uh, the health officers council I've talked to uh, uh, like different types of people in different areas doctors and, and physicians as well and tried to get uh, a consensus on what we're doing with this legislation and make sure we got everybody's concerns as dressed as well as we could and I hope that this means that we're not going to have any kind of weird infighting over this and that we can go forward. Let's save the debate for after the referendum when it comes to arguing about the nitty gritty of how we're going to actually legalize. And hopefully we can have a friendly debate. But it needs to be had. And like I said, I'm not sure, you know, if there should be a limit on how many plants you can grow at home. The model I visualize ultimately, at least as the first legal step, would be a limit on how many plants or a certain square footage area that you can grow of cannabis per household. That there would be probably the government would control the point of sale like with alcohol but hopefully not the production like with alcohol so that you get independent producers licensed to produce cannabis under different brand names and different things that would then be sold by the by the provincial government at, at or licensed cafes or places like that but this, you'd have a that the government would be the, the one that controls the sale and how it gets marketed to people, but they wouldn't be growing it all themselves and have Monsanto or whatever. That, yeah, that's right. not a model I want to see. But like with wine, where anybody can kind of get into the market, yeah. and then it's just a matter of competition. Yeah, the and wine model is best and seems yeah. really good. Yeah, and I mean, I'm open. I mean, I don't expect it to be perfect what we do the first time either. There's going to have to be a lot of rules in place only to satisfy other governments around us that are prohibitionists, but. But, de but definitely we can make some steps in the right direction. And I think the sensible BC uh, legislation is the first and very important step towards a sensible cannabis policy for BC and for Canada. And if we get, if we make this happen, when we make this happen, it's going to be hugely influential across the country. It'll be a big thing because no province will have done this before and we'll sh let other provinces both see what happens in BC and empower them to go, hey, we want to do that too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know, even if we don't win in terms of getting all the signatures there, uh, uh, and it'll be a big hill to climb. We're still going to be able to get the idea out there that the province can do something. We're going to build a big base of support, and we're gonna we're gonna build a big team that can have a big political influence in this province. But that being said, I believe we can do this. I wouldn't be investing the huge amount of money and time it's going to require if I didn't think this was possible. We have the timing is perfect. There's a broad political consensus in British Columbia. A lot of a lot of mainstream politicians. Yeah. The question has always been, yeah, we agree, but it's a federal issue. Pass the buck. Pass the buck. Yes. And I think that this legislation uh, is is the way to get around that and to show Dana. our provincial political leaders that they they've got to take. A step on and do I think that's what's ingenious about this whole idea is it, it 
provides them with no option out. I mean, it really is answering that, you know, what's always said, it's the federal government. But this way, by defunding the police, I mean, it's brilliant because if you don't have the cash to do it, you can't enforce these laws. And we're actually, I mean, it's happening on a municipal level in places like Vancouver anyway. It, it does, and certainly it depends, but that I think is more why we need to enact it everywhere. It's not really fair that right. if you happen to be in a big rally full of people in downtown Vancouver, you can smoke cannabis openly, but if you're, you know, but if you're in other areas, you're treated differently, that you'll get charged differently in different ways. And we're not looking for a free-for-all. I mean, there'd still be bylaws and smoking zones and other things like that. I mean, it makes it easier for a city to control. And if they want to license vapor lounges or something, this makes it easier for them to do that. But they don't have to. You know, no one's forcing anything like that right now. So right. it does open things up. It'll it'll give the police very strong direction not to act when it comes to simple possession. And it'll save them a lot of time and money and effort. And uh, and British Columbia should not be the province that has more marijuana possession charges per capita than any province. There's no reason. There's The rates of cannabis use have not doubled over the past five years, but the rates of possession charges charges have and so clearly this is a politically motivated or police motivated action and it's wrong I mean there's no there's no political will for this in British Columbia no one is calling for this so why is it happening I think most people aren't aware that that we're seeing these uh, that we're seeing these charges going up so rapidly and we're going to be releasing a lot of good statistics on that from the government's own information and own records it's not that hard to find a lot of this stuff and on that note if you or someone you know has ever had any interaction with a police officer in British Columbia over simple possession if the cop just asked you to put your joint out if you took your marijuana away if you got handcuffed or, or chastised or restrained or if you got taken out of the station house and strip searched or held in prison or if you were actually charged and convicted and got a criminal record we want to hear your story and we're, we're, we've got criminologist professor a, a professor of criminology Neil Boyd from Simon Fraser University who's interviewing people and getting stories so we can find out what happens to people when they interact with the police and is it different if it's RCMP than VPD well that answer is most likely yes you know and it really varies a lot as to where you are and what the situation is and how the cops feeling that day and maybe what color your skin is and how old you are and a lot of other things that really shouldn't matter um, but uh, you've got to get a hold of Neil Boyd and if you go to uh, sensiblebc.ca there's a bunch of links there how to get a hold of him his email address is nboyd for Neil Boyd nboyd at sfu.ca at Simon Fraser University where he's a professor so nboyd at sfu.ca if you've got any kind of story like that he wants to hear it and if you've got like a long one he'll get together with you to interview you in person and find out more about your story but we really want people you know it's confidential if, if, you, if we want to use your information publicly, we'll make sure we get your permission first. Otherwise, it's all confidential. But, um, but there's a lot of people who have been charged and convicted who bear the, the lifetime stigma of a criminal record for possession of marijuana. People who have been telling me they were charged 30 years ago and all the negative effects it had in their life uh, since that time and all the opportunities they were lost and travel and employment and other things that were cost to them because of uh, something. Because they happened to be the unlucky one that got picked out of the group, you know, when they were a teenager or when they were a, a young person. So, so anyways, that's what Sensible BC is all about. It's Decriminalizing possession is the first step in getting the province on the path towards a regulated and taxed system and figuring out what that's going to be. And we need your help. So get out there, volunteer, spread the word, do what you can to make this a real event or a real thing. And if you're living in Victoria, we're doing a thing on September 24th. You'll see lots of links to it on Sensible BC and on the Sensible BC Facebook page. Make sure you like us there and follow us on Twitter and all that stuff. But, uh, but yeah, we're doing an event in Victoria. We've got an MP, an, or a, an MLA, a mayor, a police officer, a doctor, and a lawyer are all going to be talking about legalized cannabis and what it means in British Columbia. And uh, it's a free event, so if you're in the Victoria, Vancouver Island region or anywhere else and you want to come over, please do on September 24th. And uh, you can find out the details at the sensiblebc.ca website. Excellent, Dana. Thanks a lot. Woo. Now people can, yeah, who take a breath there. Uh, people on the Sensible BC site can sign up to this is the pre-signature right now. Pre-signature thing you can now. Give your yes, pre-signature, right. but they can also sign up to become uh, somebody on the team. Is that right as well? Yeah, it's you the can, same form, and there's a button you can click if you want to volunteer. There's a button you can click if you want us to send you some stuff. And then if you do that, we'll get back in touch with you and ask you what you can do. There's a comments form so you can add, I am good at doing whatever and I want to volunteer. I want to send you my life savings. I want to, whatever you want to do to help us out, you can let us know. And uh, Nicole Seguin, who works with me in a lot of projects, she's very talented.
talented organizer. She's going to be getting in touch with you and uh, and putting you to work and letting you know what you can do. And if you do, if you're volunteering, you probably don't know if you can see it on the screen there or not. You get a volunteer button. Yeah, you can see that pretty good. Uh, we've got uh, other things to help you out so that when you're knocking on doors or on the street corner or whatever, just around the house in your gown. You can wear your volunteer uh, button for Sensible BC and be proud and let people know that you're part of the team and that you're trying to help out. And we've got some other buttons and swag and pens and things coming over the coming weeks, so there'll be lots of goodies to help promote this and get the word out there that we can do this in British Columbia. And this is the place where it's going to happen, and this is when it's going to happen. And you know what? I have. Uh, 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 there's a special reason why I believe this is all going to work out well for us, and uh, um, I think Adrian Dix is going to be our next premier. Uh, it, it seems pretty likely in the polls, and I got to know Adrian pretty well when we were traveling around the province together, and I was campaigning against him for the leadership of the NDP. Yep. And he's been doing a great job. I'm very glad he won the leadership. You know, he's he's a good guy. Um, but uh, he's born on April 20th. His birthday is on 420. And although Adrian's not like a marijuana user himself, and he's not someone who's like super passionate about the marijuana cause, he's certainly not averse to it either. And he's, you know, I think he, he can, he'll make some changes when we make and make it easy for him to do so. But I think that our first premier who was born on April 20th on 420, to me, that's a little sign from above that we're on the right path. And whenever I see a 420, I know I'm heading the right way. And, uh, and that is, uh, <laughs> So I feel we're heading the right way with this thing. So that's just a, there you a, go. a that's, silly that's little thing there as well. Cool. But uh, there you go. For well, the when he becomes there. the premier of the province, we'll have to have him come speak on his birthday at 420 to the art gallery. Yeah, well, we'll see. Definitely <laughs> we can sing happy, happy birthday to him. Happy birthday. Uh, happy birthday to Adrian Dix on 420. But fantastic. anyway, that's just a funny, silly little awesome. thing. Awesome. Thanks, but, Dana. Uh, but once again, definitely get involved. This is the campaign. Can this I see is the, the most important. Button? I mean, I, I, I've been, I'm going to become a volunteer. You know, I've been working in the cannabis world and cannabis legalization or decriminalization or law reform or whatever for over 20 years now, you know, since I was a teenager. And um, I really think that this is uh, something that we can really do and that this is the most important and biggest uh, effort we've made. And I think it's really the culmination of, of so many things that have been put in place over the years. The timing is perfect. The iron is hot. It's time for us to strike and make these changes. And I hope that you will join me in this dream that I have of changing the laws to a referendum in British Columbia because we can make this dream come true. So let's awesome, make it happen Dana. together. Thank you very Excellent. much. Excellent. Thanks, Dana. Hey, a pleasure to be on your show. show. Always good to have you on the show. Dana Larson, of course, the founding editor of Cannabis Culture Magazine, uh, and now the founder of Sensible BC. We're going to legalize right. it in the That's province. Right. Yeah, Decrim, really first at le very least. Uh, SensibleBC.ca. SensibleBC.ca. Right. Posting in there as well. Oh, yes. Oh, Jody's in the chat. Hi, Jody. All right, well, that's it. I don't know you're so done. Or are you doing uh, No, we have one more segment. Okay. Yeah, we're going to so get uh, MedMark in here. Thanks, Dana. Good, Always good, good to have you on the show. Give me cannabis that. salute. All right, good Cannabis stuff. salute. Good stuff. Awesome. Uh, Dana Larson. That's very cool. Sensible BC, I'm going to head over there and put my name down, my pre-signature down, ASAP, and sign up to be a volunteer. Does that mean I can keep this button, Dana? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So um, we don't actually have another video to play or anything, do we, Marius? I think we played all our videos. But um, that's okay because I can just bring Mark up real quick here. I believe he's waiting for us on Skype. Uh, I'm just going to look over here. Uh, where is he? Sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe he's not. I don't know. Uh, that's you. No. Okay, well, we're going to have to call Mr. Medmark. Now, I guess I should set this up a little bit. Mark, uh, I did talk about it at the beginning of the show a little bit for anybody who just joined us. Medmark is, of course, the founder of iMedicate in Vancouver, which is a marijuana dispensary that has two locations or had two locations. One of them was raided in February of this year, and Mark and his mom have now both been charged with a number of charges. And unfortunately, um, actually they're both out of the province at the moment, I believe, but uh, Mark has a warrant out for his arrest now, so he's joining us from China, where he is. But Mark also is working on a project with Chris Bennett, who is a friend of the show, and also, uh, uh, sorry, Marius, if you put it just down a little bit, it was going pretty high. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, so sorry, Chris Bennett, 
cannabis historian, activist, uh, also the urban shaman here at 307 West Hastings. And they're working on a project, it's a film about some of Chris's research. And this research looks at the history of cannabis use throughout the ages. And Mark's in China because he's going to be checking out a cannabis corpse. Oh, I have an incoming call from Mr. Mark Clokeed. Good timing. Med Mark in the house. Nice. Fantastic. Now here I'm going to give you a microphone here. So we were just setting you up, uh, talking about some of your overseas exploits, and I guess we should start with the whole I Medicate situation. Um, maybe you just want to go over what happened at the Renfrew location at I Medicate there. Um, I was actually on uh, my Spanibus Amsterdam tour uh, in February and uh, in Spain, I believe, yeah, going to Spanibus. And uh, I was in Paris and I got a phone call that I Medicate 2 had been raided. And uh, my mom had been uh, basically served a warrant at I Medicate. And uh, so they're now, after six months later, are charging us with uh, I've got a possession for the purpose of traffic, and my mom's got three counts for uh, trafficking and whatnot. So that's the story. Uh, apparently, there's some a couple neighbors in the neighborhood that had called and complained to the police, and uh, we'd never heard anything of it. I actually spoke to the school afterwards. Uh, the principal of the school, and uh, he said that they didn't complain and that they had had, actually had a couple complaints from two neighbors. So um, I believe a couple neighbors in the neighborhood have uh, got the cops an excuse to come try and investigate us. Um, I don't know all the details, but I understand that they posed as a patient and uh, bought off my mom allegedly. And uh, yeah, so that's where we're at, basically. They're targeting dispensaries and patients. And they also destroyed the shit out of your safe there and damaged all your stuff. Broke yeah, into a and, door. Uh, and... uh, you know, they, they were really basically assholes. Let's put it, you know, straight. They had the, the PPD drug enforcement team or whatever you want to call them, the so-called drug enforcement team, even though you can go shoot up heroin or coke at Insight or buy the street with the CC. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, anyways, the I guess medical marijuana is, dispensaries are top priority. But um, yeah, they... Cracked open the safe when my mom could have easily have opened it for them. She was right there, obviously. Um, I had a separate office with a separate lease upstairs. They kicked that door in. It was absolutely empty. Um, yeah, they just went out of their way to be dicks about it. Uh, when we said we were going to reopen, they told us they'd come back with uh, black gloves and that the first time they'd come in with white gloves. That's uh, what my lawyer told me when I inquired about what was going on. So, so a veiled uh, threat, basically. Oh, yeah. And uh, the irony is, is two doors down from the dispensary is a gun store and uh, a tattoo place. So uh, guns kill, pot doesn't. And uh, I don't know. I just I see in the media that they're saying that we're, uh, you know, selling marijuana around a school or whatever. There's pharmacies in so many areas around schools in Vancouver uh, that dispense lethal medication, much more lethal than anything marijuana has ever done right. or pharmaceutical wise it's 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 just i don't know i just think it's outrageous that they can even compare it like that so yeah that's what i'm facing uh maybe this is an opportunity i was listening to dana there and i fully support sensible bc but, uh i hope that maybe this will be a way for us to get the politicians to see and open our eyes we're really wasting taxpayers money on people like me who clearly are selling to patients so um i mean Marijuana is a very, very, very safe drug, and uh, to compare it to anything other than what it is, is it, it's just wrong. So, um, yeah, I hope that, you know, I can mitigate the situation uh, swiftly. I'm, I'm more worried about my mom than anything, and, uh, but uh, I really don't have a surprise that, um, that this was going to happen. I, I, I'm, I am a little surprised they took so long, but you know what? This is an opportunity to change a law. you got to challenge a law. So, or start a referendum. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. But, uh, well, and I was going to ask you now, do you have uh, a lawyer? I guess it's pretty early on in things. And actually, you're a fugitive right now on the lam here in uh, China. And you, there's a warrant out for your arrest, isn't there? It's a BC-wide warrant. So actually, I could fly to Calgary. I'm good to go. But uh, 
I, even though I think isn't trafficking federal, I, you'd think they'd give me a federal warrant. Yeah, I don't know Oops. how that works, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, it's probably best. Uh, well, yeah, do you think they're, you thought they're going to get you at the airport when you come in? Uh, and I wonder if that's going to happen. You online and they're saying that they uh, were away in Jamaica or something like that, and uh, they're federal exemptee and they'd gotten raided. And then uh, he was told he'd get taken down at the airport, but he never did. So, um, but either way, I'll be prepared to go on my long flight and, and arrive and yeah. get searched by customs as usual. They'll go through me like a comb and nail. They'll go through my shit. And uh, yeah, then I'll probably have to sit in the cell for the evening and uh, go to court in the morning and hopefully get bail. So um, I don't know when I'm coming back. I got to get this. Uh, awesome footage that I'm planning on getting. I'm not going to let these charges stand in the way. And, um, yeah, so that's where I'm at, basically. But I, I have hired uh, Philip Riddell. Actually, when this went down, uh, my uh, my mother uh, obviously needed a lawyer right away. And uh, we were actually not formally charged um, at the raid. So my mom never got um, arrested or anything like that, contrary to popular belief. I've heard from multiple people that my mom got charged. No charges were laid. So, uh, yeah, we got to get charged and uh, fingerprinted. And anyways, yeah, Philip Riddell is the name of the lawyer that I hired. Um, I myself uh, might have to hire my own lawyer, according to Philip, saying that there might be some conflict of interest because we are uh, separately charged. But um, either way, uh, Philip Riddell is a great lawyer. And, uh, of course, if I need another one, I know who I'm going to call. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Excellent, but man. Well, uh, I was going to say you're going to have to cover the entire thing for Pot TV. The weed guy is innocent of these marijuana charges. <laughs> well, I mean, quite frankly, if the cop poses as a patient or if anyone that's, you know, of age can make the decision to purchase marijuana, I, I think it's not illegal. Um, I be believe that it's a right for any human being to choose what medicine they want to use, especially when Ivy League professors are telling people that it's never killed anyone, it's it's medical I mean well that it's okay uh, to justify it so um, I really don't see how I've done anything illegal regardless of what they say um, and that I will fight for that right I think it's a constitutional right and uh, I'm actually kind of impressed that they're charging me I mean they know that I've got the lawyers I've got the support I've got the media support why are they charging me in reality? You know, this may be just an opportunity, but either way, I'm gonna make it loud and clear that I did nothing wrong and defend myself accordingly. Publicly, I'll film everything. No, I'm glad, I'm actually glad, I, I hate to say it that way, but in a way, this uh, will bring a lot of attention to it because it is you. You know, it's, it's a wonder they did go after you because you, you know, you'd think they'd know you're gonna make a big deal about it. Everything that you're involved in, you always make a big deal about, uh, which has been yeah. a few things. Even uh, at the city council there, the other, maybe, I don't know if we should get into that whole thing, actually, because I want to get into why you're in China, or at least part of the reason why you're in China. But uh, let's... Cited, uh, the, the city is forwarding a letter to me asking the federal government to, uh, as a director on the Coquitlam uh, Natural Path Dispensary, and uh, so hopefully when I get back, I can work on that also. I actually got a letter from the city of Coquitlam requesting that I get a dispensary license. So um, I'd like to see how the VPD case stands up when I show that letter in court. Nah. I mean, in reality, this is a joke. This is just a waste of money. For me, I feel bad that we're wasting so much money on, like they had to get an undercover cop to go to the dispensary. They had to like go through all this work. They have all these cops, lawyers, the Crown had to approve charges. This is your taxpayer dollar paying for this. And I think it's just outrageous. Right, and for those who don't know, the Coquitlam thing, um, it's not just in Vancouver that the police are going after medical marijuana dispensaries, but police and politicians in other places, the RCMP um, is working with local politicians in places to shut down the same type of uh, dispensaries. So, and that just happened in Coquitlam where the, the Natural Path Society was there. They tried to shut them down. Mark, you were working on, you were on the board there, and you went and spoke very passionately at the city council meeting. Uh, I thought what you said was fantastic, and it's a, a real shame that they decided to ban dispensaries there. Yeah, uh, for people that don't know, they passed a bylaw saying that if you were to have a dispensary there, you have to have a federal permit to dispense weed, which there's no such thing. Yeah. Uh, they're not giving so, those away. And uh, they also bam. passed a bylaw 
for uh, for people that designate a grower in the city of Coquitlam, they're not allowed to grow in a residential area. They'd have to grow in a predetermined kind of like a commercial area that they've they've zoned. And uh, it's kind of funny, but the, there's absolutely no space available for lease in any of those zoned areas. So um, yeah, I mean. I don't think politicians realize that um, I myself am 30. I'm the echo of the baby boomers. And, uh, and the baby boomers are the ones that have been in power. They're your parents if you're around my age. And uh, we're a voting group of people now. And uh, I don't know anyone my age that's down for pot to be illegal and put people in jail. So I'm really excited that the baby boomers are going to die. We're going to be in power, and the transition has actually been happening this last five years and for the next five to ten years, where they're going to be too old to be in power, and we're going to have to take over. So I think it's a real key time right now, and I think that the federal government and Harper, they know that. They're going to try and pass as much as they can. They're going to put their robots in place to you know, implement big business and all the other lobbyists that are actually making these laws and keeping them illegal. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be able to fight this fight, but uh, I hope everyone supports not only Dana, but me and Paw TV. It really needs to be a group effort. Um, I know Dana said it was his dream. Well, I know it's everyone else's dream out there also. And uh, I think people should join his dream. He's not a one-man show. So, and um, yeah, I think it really is time. I think we're at a key moment, like Dana was saying, for voting. Voting, it's holding your politicians accountable. They're scared. At the bylaw meeting, I really realized that um, none of those politicians want to actually say marijuana is bad, we want it illegal. When confronted with a camera and them to say there's point on camera, they all bowed out and said it was a federal issue, that there's no federal program to be able to dispense marijuana and they can't recommend anything illegal. But they all supported medical marijuana. That's right. Is, so I believe that if you get a camera on our prime minister or a camera on our politicians, constantly asking them the same question about medical marijuana, I for one believe that they will definitely have to succumb to the people. Eighty percent didn't Dana say or pro pot? Oh, there's well, yeah, the numbers are huge. There's very few against the idea of marijuana decriminalization when they yeah, add up. So yeah. people accountable let's uh, have like a database where people can like go on camera and be like uh, you know give their say that they're for medical marijuana or not for it and then uh, you'll know which neighbors are for it or not for it you really need to have that communication with people around yeah for sure Ask, are you for pot are you not for pot debate it at the bus stop waiting for the bus grandma's there you're smoking your pipes looking at you weird Talk to her about pot. Tell her there's been zero deaths. Or ask her. But my favorite question to ask people is, do you know anyone that's ever died from marijuana? Exactly. None. Yeah. And you can't say that about anything else, really. I mean, people die from taking too much Tylenol. Happens all the time, but you can get it on every street corner and every convenience store and every drug store. Yeah, you know, you can die overdose well, from drinking water. too much booze. I was watching on Oprah a long time ago. They had a, it was a hazing special on college hazing, and they had some guy drink uh, some student drink like out of a five gallon thing of water he passed out everyone thought he was drunk at the party at the hazing party or whatever and uh he died from drinking too much water you can die from drinking too much water so. yeah but you can't die from pot no it's crazy yeah. so besides this whole i medicate situation which i wish you the best of luck on you're also in china because you're getting some footage for an upcoming film that you're working on with mr chris bennett and yeah. maybe tell people what's going on with the film and what you're doing there specifically. Well, uh, China is uh, where the Silk Road is and over the last thousands of years, there's been a lot of mixing of cultures in that area. And uh, at the, by the Gobi Desert in Turpan in Western China, they discovered uh, seven or eight mummies, correct me if I'm wrong, but anyways, I'm interested in the one mummy. Uh, he's a shaman, he's about 45 years old and uh, he was discovered with a bowl with cannabis in it and seeds. And uh, they've had it analyzed since by uh, multiple different universities. And uh, it was weed, so it's about 2,700 years old. It's the oldest cannabis ever found on Earth thus far, proving that cannabis use and medical, they said that it was procured in such a manner that it had to be medicinal. 
Um, and of course, he was uh, had a bunch of other things uh, showing that he was a shaman and of great stature. He was also of Caucasian descent. They're saying he's a mix, right. and uh, maybe from the the guy. Scythians or other other people. Anyways, I'm gonna go film that, and uh, I'm I'm basically doing a documentary with Chris on ancient cannabis use, um, showing that cannabis has been used for thousands of years and uh, with zero deaths, and that it's our medical right, and that. The reason we have cannabinoid receptors in our body is for cannabis as medicine. That's right. Yeah, we're, we co-evolve <laughs> with this damn flower. Sorry, it sounds so simple to me. It's just kind of like it needs to be laid out. I mean, Chris has written these amazing books. And uh, one thing we realize that people are not reading as much as they used to. And uh, so we're going to put a lot of what he's got in the book, a lot of his hard research and work, uh, we're going to put it into a video. So... Uh, He's getting a lot of experts. I believe they're coming in November, and he's speaking also at UBC in October. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so we're going to get a lot of footage of interviews of experts on this matter, and uh, I'm going to back it up with actual video evidence. I've, um, I'm flying to Turpan. The camera crew comes the next couple of days, and we're going, going to Turpan. We're going to a museum. We're going to fly to Uruguay, and then uh, Turpan's about 150 kilometers away. Um, I'm going to be doing videos for YouTube and for, of course, Pod TV. And uh, so I'll be giving you guys a little update of uh, my adventure and uh, we'll be getting some amazing footage. Hopefully I can get into the museum, into the right area. Um, I don't know if I can get video of the, the cannabis. I didn't ask on the phone about that, but uh, I know that the mummies are there and uh, the shaman money, mummy for sure and at the museum and it's not going anywhere for the next two weeks because apparently it does go on tour. Mm. So The yeah, mummy, really the cannabis corpse tour. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, man. Well, uh, that's fantastic. And so you actually have, of course, a lot of videos up already on Pod TV and on YouTube, the Weed Guy videos. And this is kind of uh, your thing. You do travel around the world covering it, getting herb where you go, sometimes in countries where it might be a little dangerous to do that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I think it's important that people realize that uh, we're a huge, huge group of people around the world. Uh, we're, we're any country I go to, People already know marijuana is safe. They they use it. Um, I'm I'm talking like everywhere I've ever been, and uh, some place it's a little harder. Uh, the hardest was Singapore and Malaysia. Um, I didn't bother in Singapore and uh, Malaysia is the same also. But I think that it's key that I show that culturally it's acceptable anywhere in the world I go. So um, from Vietnam to to Spain to wherever the hell I'm going, I'm I'm always seeking out. Uh, people that are of like-minded and also the experience for a patient like myself. I, I use cannabis and obviously I can't go border to border with carrying a bag of weed. So um, it is kind of an adventure for myself also and um, sometimes it may be a little risky but I think the the reward is well worth the risk. <laughs> no kidding. And uh, I think of my in reality in Canada I'm good to go. I can grow my own weed. I can access dispensaries. I was so gonna I'm say, fine in Canada. So yeah, you're a I grower Poland, as well. And you're actually ha one of two Kush brothers. Yes, Maybe yes. talk about uh, Remo, the urban grower. You guys are like bros, like really tight bros. There's a bromance <laughs> going on, I think. Well, actually, we're working on a show. Uh, we've been filming for the last two months. Um, we're going to be doing a, a, more than one show, actually, for uh, Pod TV called Kush Brothers, um, the idea in being that uh, anyone can be a Kush brother. Of course, me and Remo and Tite, everyone knows that. But uh, we figured that we travel all over the world and meet people, and uh, people always want to meet us or just smoke one with us, you know, and I want everyone to feel like they're a Kush brother. So uh, basically, that's going to be the premise of the show. Uh, we're going to do, like, restaurant reviews, and we're going to smoke in crazy places, and answer different questions and different grow rooms it's just going to be an action-packed full done show so uh, it's the first time me and Remo have ever tried to do anything like this and uh, we're working hard on it and uh, I can't wait to be able to bring out that new content for you guys it's gonna be fun for sure awesome thank you very much Mark Clokeed founder of iMedicate Kush.ca any number of other things the Kush Cup we didn't talk about the Kush Cup we haven't done a post-mortem on the Kush Cup how, uh, what do you think? It was a huge success, don't you think? That's uh, my, that was my opinion. I had fun. I don't know, did you have fun? I had a hell of a lot of fun, man, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> it was yeah, really um, good. I'm I still high from then, I think. 
I think publicity alone, it was uh, worth it for the movement. I uh, got on the Bro Jake show, of course, you were there. And uh, so in that respect, it was a huge success. And for my first event, I was really happy with the turnout. Unbelievable amount of sponsors. I'd really be crying right now that the, the Kush Cup wasn't cheap. And um, so, yeah, but it, for me, it was just a huge success. Um, more importantly, I've had so many people say they had a blast and they're coming next year. And of course, Remo's been putting out videos. I put out a few, and uh, the feedback from that is like, "Oh my God, what are the dates next year? I'm coming for sure. I'm not missing out." Uh, so for me, it was a huge success. I, I can't wait to do it. I'm doing the Health Expo next year at the PE, and then we're going to be doing the Kush Cup alongside it. So it's going to be a huge blast. All my sponsors were really happy with what they got out of it and said that they're willing to sponsor again. So I haven't had one person upset. There's that one guy on Facebook, I think, was the only person I've heard of complain. So, um, oh, yeah, I didn't even he was a success. Of course, it wasn't perfect, and uh, it was my first event ever doing that, so I know what to focus on for next time. Um, we have a lot more notice and time, so I, I hope people realize that I really did the Kush Cup this year in about three, four months' time So, uh, in, when it came to it coming together. So, yeah, so I'm excited. No, it was a huge success. I had a great time. And, I mean, even just some of the musical acts alone made it worth it, man. It was really fun. Good to see the yeah. Rascals back together. And Don't forget about the weed. He made it worth it, too. Man, there was a lot of and great stuff. And what I'm definitely doing is the extract booths. Those things were awesome. Just having uh, be able to go take a toke when everyone, I think that really helped out the situation, especially on the first day because I got late entries. Things took a little while to package it all up. And uh, to have people... Uh, be able to go meet the Butter King himself and get served a royal toke, I think was uh, an awesome idea. Of course, Rumble Stiltskin and Urban Growers Butter, it was just awesome, awesome. So, and yeah, uh, was very cool. I also realized that I think the Saturday, uh, this this Kush Cup's gonna be different because um, the Monday is Canada Day on these dates. So the dates are June 28th, 29th, and 30th, and then the Monday's Canada Day. So I was Cannabis thinking, day. I know we talked about it, but uh, maybe getting a big act to play for free for everyone on the Monday and uh, and kind of do the boat cruise on the Sunday and like big party on the Saturday and the Friday. I found that everyone was kind of partied out by the Sunday and I got about half the attendance of people that I thought would show up, right? So it was actually good, but in other words, I think Saturday is going to be like the huge night and then the Sunday will be like recovery boat cruise and then the Monday will be the free concert, maybe do the awards there or something like that. Well, wait, are you talking about July 1st, right? Because that's, yeah, also, that's also Cannabis Day at the Art Gallery, of course. That's what I'm saying. There's going to be like yeah. 10,000 people down there. And, right, uh, okay. I thought you were talking about a separate venue or something. To uh, perform on the stage to make Canada Day even bigger. Be awesome. And uh, advertise on the radio, right, that will, you know, I think that would be a really good thing if we could have like a huge act like Daniel Wesley or somebody, I don't know, we'll, we'll check who's available, to do like a free concert on the Monday, therefore attracting people that would come just for the party aspect of it to the rally. For sure. The 420 is huge. And Canada 420 Day, is huge. Are, Canada Day, I, I find a lot of people are with their families or there's a lot of events that are held in each city now where yeah. they have like fireworks, equipment and stuff. So yeah, I was sure. hoping that we can attract a another 10,000 person crowd like 420 because it's about three quarters as much numbers I'd say for Canada Day but it's a holiday this year on the Monday or next year on the Monday so I we think need, it's an opportunity we need Snoop Dogg I think Snoop Dogg uh, $70,000 for 30 minutes or $140,000 for a concert so uh, wow. yeah <laughs> that's uh, pretty steep pretty steep yeah, uh, maybe through sponsorship. You never know what we could pull off, but cool, man. Well, it was great having you on the show. I think we covered everything. Snoop Lion, someone said in the chat. Yeah, you. someone call Snoop Dogg and tell him. Yeah. You want to count. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, awesome. This time, Mark Clokeed, we're going to let you go. Thanks for coming on the show. Awesome talking with you, and uh, there's just so much to talk to you about. We'll have you back on the show sometime very soon. I'm very sure of that. I can't wait. Stay tuned for Ancient Cannabis. Uh, I'll be yeah. doing updates on YouTube, and uh, hopefully you can put them up on Paw TV. But uh, next week, we should have some footage of me out in uh, the desert looking at the tombs and going for the, the, the cream of the crop. I want to get some seeds. I want to try a toke of that weed, that 3,000-year-old weed. 
Well, uh, I guess you'll be cherishing every moment right now because when you get back, the cops will be waiting for you. Oh yeah, well, you know what? <laughs> I, um, I'm, I sleep a lot when I'm in jail, so I'll just sit there and sleep. They got nothing on me. And so I guess, uh, but you use cannabis as a medicine, so that's kind of frustrating that you won't be able to have that while you're in jail, but. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna make a big deal out of it, and I'm gonna bring uh, like Marinols and shit, so they're gonna have to give me synthetic crap. I'm also type one diabetic, so to have me in jail sucks because I need to check my blood regularly, uh, you know, like eight to ten times a day. So they got to give me this thing to like check my blood. It sucks. They're gonna hate it. So I'll, I'll be getting out. Yeah. If not, uh, you come visit me, okay? Absolutely. Better believe it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. awesome. Excellent. Thanks, I Mark. Here, I didn't do anything wrong. I haven't hurt anyone. There's no victims. So uh, for all, thank you to everyone for their support and. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully I can represent the movement in a, a good way and make this come to lemonade instead of lemons. Exactly. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for it. Talk to you soon. Yeah, peace, brother. Peace. peace. Smoke one for me. Hell yeah, I'll smoke a bong rip for you. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, so I guess that's it, guys. Uh, we did a almost two-hour show today. That's not bad at all. It's pretty nice. I'm really high, barely able to function here. <laughs> um, yeah, so my thanks to everybody who was on the show today, Dana, Kayla, Jeff, Mick, Mark, and everybody in the chat, and Mr. Marius, of course, Mr. Marius Stoner. Uh, I'm going to hit this bong, and then we're out of here. Thanks to Duchess for serving him up. delicious and thanks to you guys for watching of course and we'll be back next friday but you can see us on several other shows before then me and duchess that is and marius uh so stay tuned to pod tv and stay tuned this weekend for coverage of the prairie medicinal harvest cup see you guys peace <laughs>